good good how are you very good so uh, let me just begin i'll give a quick introduction of ashika group then move on to an introduction uh, for you and then we sure. can start sounds sure. good sounds great good. So welcome everybody. Sorry, we're running a few minutes late. This is not usually um, the style, but you know some technical challenges. Anyway, so Ashika Group is about 27 years old, a diversified financial services uh, group offering services such as brokerage, lending, investment banking, global family office services, and asset management. Our team of 300 plus work together to provide services to our 125,000 retail clients, 100 plus institutional clients, and 100 plus family offices. And I, Ishita Jen, will be your moderator for the evening. I am part of the institutional equities team with a focus in pharma at Ashika Stock Broking, where we write proprietary research for unique stock ideas and service some of the top public market funds of the country, including HDFC Mutual Fund. Um, I hold a master's in biotech enterprise from Johns Hopkins, and I have a biochemistry degree. Uh, now coming on to the guest of the hour, uh, Mr. Chir Chirag Sedalwad. Um, he has a rich background of lasting two decades in fund management and equity research, and another four years in investment banking. He started his career at ING Bearings, then joined HDFC Asset Management. Later, he moved to New Vernon Advisory before rejoining HDFC Asset Management as a senior fund manager, where he now is the head of equities. Uh, Chirag holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in the U.S., um, I think the reputation of Chirag and HDFC Mutual Fund precedes them. Um, we welcome Chirag to our platform. Thank you, sir, for taking out the time. So the agenda for today's webinar is we will start, Chirag, with your opening remarks uh, on the market, everything, whatever um, broad strokes, and then move on to a discussion with some questions that I have curated. And then we'll open the floor uh, for the attendees to ask questions. However, um, to the audience. Guys, you can submit your question anytime in the chat window and I will pick them up during our Q&A. So, Chirag, over to you. Super, Ishita. Thank you very much to you and thank you very much to Ashika for giving us this opportunity to address you on the overall markets and the outlook going forward. So, I have a brief presentation about 20-30 minutes in terms of the outlook for one, the economy and two, for equity markets in particular. And then we can turn to Q&A. Before that, before that happens, I don't want to waste anybody's time because we're already starting a bit late. So let me start with a brief on economy and then uh, moving on to markets. Um, so overall, uh, you know, I think there is a reasonable buoyancy that we are seeing in the equity markets today. And while we question what growth is going to look like this year and possibly next year, this year looks like six to seven percent, and next year is a similar number. I think what is important to keep in mind is long-term growth. And when you look at the last 40 years and you break it up into decades, each of those decades we've seen growth has been quite consistent. Despite all the challenges that the economy may have faced, we have grown consistent consistently in real terms at six to seven percent and you add another five to six percent in terms of inflation and that's why we've grown in nominal terms at 12 to 13 percent when you speak to investors and you ask them what is their expectation of returns most investors will turn around and say we expect 12 to 15 percent returns and it's important to put in mind that why are returns anchored at 12 to 15 percent why is it that return expectations are not much higher nor are they much lower and it's simply because if over a period of time the economy grows at 12 to 15 percent then it's only reasonable to expect that corporate earnings will follow that pattern it will also grow at 12 to 15 percent and mimicking growth in corporate earnings stock market will also eventually over a period of time give that kind of return and hence 12 to 15 percent is a reasonable expectation from investors. Now, having said that, uh, clearly not all investors have had a 12 to 15 percent return expectation, uh, return experience. Sorry, there are those who've had a far better experience and those who've had a far worse experience. Despite the fact that, as we mentioned, growth has been quite consistent. So, why is it that despite growth being consistent, there are those who've had much higher returns and those who've had much poorer returns? And in our minds, it comes down and boils down to a very simple thought process. And that is the following, which is the market broadly falls into three categories. And as simplistic as it sounds, we feel this is the crux of the argument. The first category is when the market is cheap. The market is cheap when typically P multiples are between 10 and 15 times. 
it is a time when markets usually face a challenge that is why the market is cheap there is usually more bad news than good news and retail investors typically don't participate in this market when you invest in this market not only do you get earnings growth of 10 to 15% but you see that valuations tend to improve over a period of time and hence your returns are a accumulation of growth as well as an improvement in valuations and therefore you make returns which are above average you tend to get 15 20 25% returns next you move move to a market bucket in which where market is reasonably priced now the p multiples which were earlier 10 to 15 now move to an environment where there are where the p multiples have moved up to 15 to 20 uh, valuations are now reasonable and hence over a period of time valuations neither go up nor go down and you get returns in line with growth it's a easier market to invest in to some extent than a challenging cheap market and the news flow tends to be mixed lastly come to a category which is expensive here valuations which used to be 10 to 15 have moved to 15 to 20 and now have moved to 20 30 it's a far easier market to invest in because there is a lot of good news right because markets move up with enthusiasm markets move up with good news retail money flows in very easily investors are happy to put money in but it's possibly the worst time to do that because valuations appear stretched so the key question to ask is what kind of environment are we in today are we in an environment where the market is cheap with a multiple of 10 to 15 reasonable 15 to 20 or somewhat expensive at 20 plus so uh ishita can can you see the uh, the slides yes fantastic so if you just give me a minute so what we have here we spoke about so i'm just going to run through the slides a little bit but the first slide covers what we spoke about in terms of growth and before we get into valuations for a minute let us touch upon some of the key things that we are observing in the economy today and i think there are three or four trends which are particularly relevant and we've highlighted that here so one is we are seeing a big shift from the unorganized to the organized players and i think this is important because in india the unorganized sector has a large representation so whether you look at plywood or air coolers or coconut oil or paints the unorganized has a share of anywhere from 30 to 70% and what has happened in the last several years is we've seen share beginning to shift and that trend is really picked up in the last couple of years we first had the advent of demonetization and we thought that would result in a big shift but it only started the shift then we had the advent of gst which uh, gave further impetus to that shift and most recently we've had the incidence of covid and what's happened in covid is it has really added to the first two trends and uh, there's been a uh, difficulty for unorganized companies to access raw material there's been difficulty in in uh, unorganized companies to access uh, people and so on and now we are seeing an across the board trend where market share is shifting away from unorganized companies to organized players and this is the first big trend that we are observing the second is we are seeing the china plus one story unfolding and the first trend that took place in the last few years was that cost in china began to rise and but that wasn't enough uh, companies had uh, global companies had invested significant capital in, in in china and rising cost was not going to displace that all by itself then we saw that rising environmental compliance and china became a lot more strict in terms of adherence to comply uh, adherence to environmental norms and uh, while that uh, gave further impetus to global companies to look at uh, non china manufacturing the real uh, the real change happened with covid-19 and the kind of supply disruption which took place and because of the supply disruption global companies realized that you cannot be overly dependent on china for your manufacturing and you need to look at at countries outside of china and uh, i think india is an obvious choice in that sense because it's a large domestic market with huge access to skilled resources and a number of government incentives in place to make in india uh, a more robust platform so we are seeing now uh the china plus one story and the unorganized to organized story really playing out extremely well and we are seeing a number of sectors and a number of companies which are benefiting from that i think the third big trend and we really try to focus on the big trends because uh, while there are uh, a lot of pluses and minuses in the economy we really feel these are three large trends which are taking place and the third big trend is an improvement in the Uh, in the health of the financial system and this is key because banking provides the essential liquidity to move the economy forward and what we've seen is 
the last few years, we've seen NPAs have corrected from what used to be as high as 6% to as low as 2%. So asset quality of banks has improved. At the same time, capital adequacy, which used to be 14, 15%, has now risen to as high as 16, 17%, which means banks have a lot more capital on their books. So asset quality has improved, system capital adequacy has risen, and at the same time, credit growth, which used to be 8-9%, has now improved and is uh, around 14-15-16%. percent So we feel banks are in a far better situation than they have been in the past. And the last big trend we are seeing is on housing. And what we've observed, and we've been traveling across the country in the last few months, and uh, this has reiterated this hypothesis, that prices have been largely flat. And despite prices being flat, we've seen... Uh, you know, in the last 10 years, we would have seen salaries going up by 40, 50, 60, 70 percent over that period cumulatively, which means affordability of houses has gone up. And along with the new regulation in the form of RERA, it has really resulted in a big shift in terms of the approach to buying under construction housing. And off late, we've seen an improvement in new launches and an improvement in sales. And this is important because housing feeds into a large number of sectors, because when you buy a house, you need to buy cement, you need to buy steel, you need to buy plywood, you need to buy consumer durables, you need to buy lighting, and so on and so forth. So I think what we're trying to highlight, just going back to the first slide, is these are three or four big trends that we are seeing, a shift from unorganized to organized, and unorganized is a large component of the Indian economy. The China plus one story is playing out with a combination of better pricing, lower environmental compliance, as well as uh, diversification from a supply chain standpoint. Banks are in a far better situation and housing affordability is at an all time high. And as a result of this, or a combination of this, we are seeing that the Indian economy actually, actually is faring quite well. And this is in quite in contrast to what you are seeing outside of India. So outside of India, if you look at the three large economic blocks, you are seeing the US slowing down, you're seeing China slowing down, uh, led by real estate worries. You're seeing Europe's load um, uh, particularly impacted by um, uh, commodity prices and gas prices uh, specifically. And in that environment, actually, India's growth is quite resilient. So we are probably the largest economy which is uh, growing at a at a clip of sort of 5-6% uh, or 6-7% this year and at a similar pace next year. So India is actually doing quite well. Now, having said that, there are a number of uh, concerns out there, and we'll quickly touch upon these and then move to markets because that tends to be the more exciting conversation. Uh, and the big risks today are in terms of elevated commodity prices. And that has resulted in higher inflation and that has also resulted in higher interest rates. So let us quickly uh, move to that and uh, what is our perspective or my perspective on, uh, on commodity prices. So we've seen a sharp improvement, a uh, sharp rise, I should say, in commodity prices. And it really has been a perfect storm. And what do we mean by that? Uh, Post-COVID, we saw that demand, which had come down, recovered very quickly, and that pushed up commodity prices. On top of that, we saw supply constraints led by COVID, both within China and outside of China, a large number of people leaving the U.S. workforce, the European workforce, and hence supply was constrained. Demand recovered nicely, supply was restrained. And in, in this environment, China decided to follow a no COVID or zero COVID policy which meant that the manufacturing hub of China was constantly going through a start-stop process. While the rest of the world accepted that COVID is something which is inevitable, China continued to believe that it could control COVID. And hence, manufacturing could constantly started and stopped, which impacted supply further. In this overall environment, on top of all of this, we had significant liquidity getting infused. So what we've shown at the bottom here is how fiscal deficits and central balance sheet, central bank balance sheets expanded. And a lot of this money flowed into commodities. So speculation not, not only happens in equity markets, but also happens significantly in commodities. And on top of all of that, we had the issue of Russia and Ukraine, which constrained co the supply of commodities, particularly of things like wheat and oil. And hence, commodity prices reached, in many cases, all-time highs. So what is the way forward? We've already seen a correction in commodity prices. Demand, which, had, which was very elevated, has started to moderate. We can see a slowdown in Europe, slowdown in China, slowdown in America as well. Supply, which was constrained, is now beginning to recover. With commodity prices being extremely elevated, 
the profitability in commodities is very high and hence companies are looking to maximize output. Supply constraints are easing and we can see that in the freight rates which have come down meaningfully. So the issues in terms of lack of truckers, lack of people at ports, those things have started to ease. China, we are expecting, will also begin to normalize its activity and gradually abandon its, its zero COVID policy. China's Congress meets now in, in the next few months. And post that, we think that this policy will get liberalized. So all of this we expect will start having an impact. What we've shown here is global growth is expected to reduce by 1% to 3.2%, and in fact, possibly can come down. The US from four to two. And we can see already the impact of this being felt in commodity prices. And what we've shown here is how aluminum, steel, wheat, palm oil have already corrected very, very substantially by 40, 50%. And we are still to see, even crude has corrected from what used to be close to $120, $120 to about $90. Coal and gas remain resilient, but barring those two, those impacted much greater by the conflict in Russia, we've already seen commodity prices correct reasonably. And we think going forward, commodity prices will continue to soften because demand is weak, because supply is coming back, because liquidity is getting pulled out of the system. So that's our view on on commodities. So let me quickly touch upon valuations, what we spoke about right at the beginning, which is in terms of where are valuations today? We spoke about the cheap bucket, the reasonable bucket, and the expensive bucket. Today, the Nifty trades at a one-year forward valuation from a PE standpoint at 19 times. The average is roughly 17. So we're trading at about a 10% premium to averages, which means that we are in an environment where, no, is the market cheap? No, the market is cheap and typically multiples, as we said, are 10 to 15 times. We are not in a cheap environment. But however, we are not also in an environment where valuations are expensive. We are close to historical averages. We're at about a 10% premium. And 10% premium is not a very significant number. And hence, over a period of time, investors who will hold onto equities for a five to 10 year period can continue to expect that returns will be driven largely by growth. And growth, as I mentioned, in the Indian context, with the economy growing at 12%, 13%, that's a reasonable expectation for investors to have. Valuation either cheap, nor are they expensive. They're somewhat in the middle, but a 10% premium to historical averages. But this is as far as the nifty goes. So this is as far as large caps go. So let us quickly look at how it is for mid caps. And we have seen a reasonable rally in mid caps uh, or a very sharp rally, I should say, in mid caps in FY21-22. And now we've seen a bit of moderation in this year. And post this, we have seen that valuations, because of the rise in indices and because of the performance, that valuations of mid caps has now reached about 22 times versus an average of about 18, which makes it a roughly 20% premium to historical averages. What does that mean? It means that when we, if you go back, what we spoke about Nifty, Nifty trading at 19 times versus 17 times, it's about a 10% premium. It seems to be okay. Mid caps at 22 times versus 18 times is at roughly a 20% premium. And we think that is on the expensive side. So we would prefer in this environment to look at large caps compared to mid caps. The other way of looking at this is to look at mid cap versus large cap. So what we do is we look at the mid cap P and compare it to the large cap P. And we have this on the top right hand side. And what has happened is historically mid caps traded at a premium of 5%. Today that premium has extended 15%. So once again, when we look at that metric, it seems to suggest that large caps are a better, a better position at this current juncture compared to mid caps. And then, of course, we want to look quickly at small caps as well. And here we've shown you the left-hand side top chart shows you the P multiple of small caps over a period of time. And today we are at a 16, sorry, 16 and a half times one year forward P compared to an average of about 14 and a half times. So it's roughly about a 10% premium. So going back, Large caps and small caps are both trading at a 10% premium, which we think is okay. 
mid caps are trading at a 20% premium, which we think is on the higher side. So we think this is an environment to focus more on large caps and more on small caps. Having said that, let us briefly touch upon sector valuations. So let me again, before I get into sector valuation, summarize that we remain constructive on markets. We feel that markets are reasonably priced and growth and outlook will be driven, sorry, and returns and outlook will be driven more by growth as opposed to valuations changing and growth is still reasonable in India. From a sector valuation standpoint, what we've shown here is the current PE of various sectors and compared them to the historical averages to get a sense in terms of what is cheap, what is reasonable and what is expensive today. And what you see on the right hand side is things like metals, private banks, utilities, pharma, and even PSU banks are trading at reasonable valuations. IT and oil and gas is a little bit expensive and auto consumer durables, consumer staples and cement to some extent are expensive. And our preference is to be today in sectors where valuations are more sensible and where the outlook is also reasonably positive. We spoke about banks earlier, where NPS have come down, the growth outlook has improved and capital adequacy is high. Despite the improvement in outlook, banks, both private sector and public sector, continue to trade at reasonable valuations. And hence it is a sector where we are optimistic. At the same time, pharma, which is trading in line with its historical valuations, we find that the domestic market is performing quite well and growing at 10 to 12%. And hence, that is another sector where we are positive. Utilities, valuations are sensible and yields are quite attractive. And that too remains a segment where we are optimistic. Where we are more concerned is in terms of consumer, where valuations appear stretched and trade at about a 30% premium to the historical averages. At the same time, consumer durables as well trade at a material risk premium to where they have in the past, and hence it's a segment that we prefer to avoid. Having said this, while we have spoken about sectors, I think the key is to look at individual companies. Because even in a sector like auto, which is expensive, if we drill down to a company specific level, we can continue to find individual opportunities and individual companies which are interesting. And even in sectors which are cheap, like banks, we will find individual companies which are particularly expensive, which we would like to avoid. So while we do talk about sector valuations, I think it is more important to keep in mind that even within sector valuations, or as important to keep in mind that within sector valuations, there will always be company-specific opportunities, which may diverge from our view on a particular sector. The outlook for growth in India is reasonably positive. We've had good growth in the last two years. And even this year, earnings growth in India is expected to be 12% and expected next year to improve to about 15 odd percent. So what are we saying in summary? Outlook for growth is quite positive. There is stable consumption. The outlook for infra and CapEx in particular looks good. There are a number of variables and a number of trends which we are seeing which are positive, which includes positive housing demand, a shift from unorganized to organized companies. Balance sheets of companies are quite positive. Valuations are reasonable, about 10% premium to historical averages, and hence returns should be in line with growth over the medium term. Rising rates, elevated commodity prices are the key risks out there, but we've already seen somewhat of a correction in commodity prices and going forward, we think commodity prices will continue to soften simply because we are in an environment where growth is looking more challenging outside of India. To me, this is an extremely important slide because it talks about some of the most important issues as far as investing goes. And this is about asset allocation and investing for the long term. I think very often as investors, we get caught up in fund selection. And we focus most of our energies on choosing a fund house or a particular fund, whether it's HDFC or ICICI or Mirai or Axis or so on and so on. 
But I think what is much more important is to get asset allocation right. Because at the end of the day, what does asset allocation mean? It means a choice between, fundamentally between equities and fixed income. Equities will, over a period of time, give you 12 to 15% return. And debt will, over a period of time, give you 5 6% return. So the difference between equity and debt is 5 to 7%. The difference between a particular fund's return and how it differs from another fund house's return will be a couple of percent. Sometimes you'll be ahead, sometimes you'll be behind. But the key is not about selecting individual funds, but it's about getting asset allocation right. Because equities at 12, 13% will give you almost 6 to 7%, not 5 to 6, but 6 to 7% higher returns than what you will get in fixed income. So asset allocation is extremely important. How much you have in equities? whether that's 20%, 30%, 40%, 40% or 80%, is a much more, a much bigger driver of your returns as opposed to within that equities, whether you have fund house A, B, C, or D. The second is to invest for the long term. And very often we forget the power of compounding and the following slide will give us some perspective on this. And this is really about investing for as long as you can. And many investors ask us, what is the correct time horizon? And we certainly feel three to five years is a minimum time horizon that investors should look at as far as equities go, but the longer, the better. And lastly, how is, what is the best way of investing? I think SIP is still a fundamentally strong approach to investing. It allows us to invest in markets which are, to invest in markets which are both up and down and over a period of time, hence returns will average to long-term returns of 12 to 15%. But let me talk about the power of compounding and long-term investing. And what this is a particularly interesting slide. What we have shown here is returns for the HDFC FlexiCap fund since its inception, since 1995. There were almost 10,000 days in this period of time. And one lakh rupee invested in HDFC FlexiCap fund today is worth a crore of rupees. The fund did extremely well and when a return of 18.5% compounded, all days invested, which is what the chart at the bottom shows you. But what we find is very few investors held on for this extended period of time. Less than 1% of starting investors held on to HDFC Flexica fund till today. So 99.5% of investors at some point or another exited the fund. So long-term investing, if you are not invested for the long-term, you wouldn't have benefited from this kind of compounding. A lot of investors feel they can time the market. They want to get out in bad times, get back in what they think are good times. But what we can see here is while the return for the fund is 18.5% since inception, if you missed 40 days, the 40 best days of returns, right? so an investor tries to get in and get out, he misses the 40 best days. And that is 40 days out of 10,000 trading days. Your return falls from 18% to 9%, almost halves. So the key in stock markets is not timing the market, but it is about time in, time spent in the market, which is a lot more important. And hopefully the slide illustrates that point. So that's what we had from an equity market perspective. Uh, we are just trying to showcase one particular fund here, which is our small cap fund, which we think is, uh, is quite interesting. And what we've shown here is how market cap is divided in India. And I'm particularly very excited about small cap investing over an extended time frame. And the reason is there is a lot of choice in small caps. So top 100 companies are large cap, the next 150 are mid cap, and the balanced companies, more than 1500 companies are considered to be small caps. So there's a large amount of choice available in the small cap universe. And I think this itself is a key advantage. The flexibility to choose between a wide variety of businesses gives the small cap universe a big advantage. The second is, why is it that small caps do well over a period of time? It's not only that there is a wide selection of businesses available. As a business becomes larger and larger in size, more and more people start following that company. So if you look at the large cap, which we've shown here, highlighted by the BSE 100, you typically have 30, 40 analysts covering a large cap. You go to a mid cap, you'll have 15, 20 analysts who track or cover 
a mid cap company. And when you go to a small cap, you'll have even fewer. So there is less competition and less understanding in a small cap company versus a large cap company. And as a company grows in size, more and more investors and more and more analysts start tracking and following the company. And that tends to lead to a re-rating of a business over a period of time. As a company gets larger in size, the institutional holding also goes up. It moves from being more retail to more held by financial institutions, both domestic and international. Disclosure levels improve. Small companies tend to disclose less information. And as the company grows in size, the information disclosure goes up. And that too leads to more familiarity, greater transparency, and better valuations. Small caps are also unique because unlike large caps, which are concentrated in five or six industries, so top 10 industries in a large cap universe account for almost 85% of the index. So a large cap is predominantly represented by banking, software, financials, petroleum, and consumer and durables. But if you want to invest in chemicals, in healthcare, in retailing, pesticides, in telecom equipment, in construction, in aerospace, in defense, a lot of which are emerging sectors, these companies are all small caps or mid caps. And it gives you a much more diverse exposure within your portfolio. This is the HDFC small cap fund. We've tried to give you a brief snapshot in terms of our large holdings and some portfolio statistics. And what you can see is we have a well-diversified product, top 10 holdings being 30%, a portfolio turnover, which is low at 10%, which means we are holding stocks for five to 10 years, well-diversified at 65 companies. We are predominantly small cap, in the sense that 80% is small cap or 10% is mid, the balance is cash, large cap. So without getting more into the fund, I think with this, we will uh, close the presentation. We have a mid-cap opportunities fund, which if, invest, which if your investors are interested in, we can touch upon that as well. But I think the key before we close is just to summarize what we've spoken about till date, uh, which is try and think of the market in very simple terms. And when we look at markets and we try and categorize it as a market which is reasonable, a market which is cheap, and a market which is expensive. As I said, when you invest in a cheap market, your returns are far superior, but those are tough markets to invest in because that's when a market faces a lot of bad news. So bottom of the financial crisis, at the time of COVID, when COVID was at its peak, that's the bottom of the market. Your valuations go to 10, 11 times, but there is so much bad news, it's tough to invest, but if you do invest, your returns tend to be very strong. Then you have peak of markets when there is a lot of good news, Markets are very elevated. It's easy to invest then, but your returns tend to be compromised because you're getting in at valuations which are extended. And then there are those markets which are reasonably priced, where valuations are neither expensive nor cheap and returns tend to be reasonable. We feel that we are in a market, we've shown you nifty trades at 10% premium, small cap trades are again at 10% premium. So we are roughly broadly around a market which is reasonably priced. I think with that, we've taken a fair amount of time in terms of making the presentation. So I will hand it over to Ishita to ask questions and thank everybody for their attention and their participation. Great, thanks Chirag, great presentation. Um, actually, before we go on to Q&A, there's one question in the Q&A box that uh, pertains to the um, uh, small cap uh, uh, fund. The sure. question is Chirag, could you share the portfolio stats? That is portfolio drilled down with respect to HDFC small cap, uh, ROC, FCF yield and growth. Oh, fantastic. So we're very happy to say that uh, we've got uh, very attractive metrics to the small cap fund. So today on a one year forward basis, the P of the fund is about 15 times. The ROE is about 16 and the growth is about 17%. So if you take a step back and think of this a little bit differently, if you think of this as a stock for those who invest directly in equities, you think of this as a stock with, which is trading at a P of 15, which is growing 17, 18% and ROE of 16. Uh, percent. And we think those are very strong metrics, right? So if somebody presented that as an idea, as a stock, we'd be extremely interested to know what that stock is. And that is the metric that we have at the small cap fund today. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Great. So now we can um, get on to some other questions. So uh, Chirag, first up, uh, you know, we can start with the hot headlines coming in from our mother market, 
um, you know, the US where uh, CPI data came in yesterday and yes. it said the US markets in uh, deep red, so to speak. And now Fed will reach for bigger weapons in their arsenal. How do you see this impacting Indian markets? Um, so a couple of things, uh, you know, it's interesting Shada, you pointed that out because um, I think over the long term or over the medium term, this will have an impact, right? Because rising interest rates and rising inflation and slowing growth uh, will certainly have an impact. Uh, one on valuations, because what is valuations? It's a, it's a discounting of future cash flows. So when your interest rates go up, your valuations tend to go down. So we've come off an environment of very low interest rates. The last 10 years were dominated by low interest rates. And so valuations moved up. The next 10 years may certainly see higher interest rates, in which case valuations may trend downwards. I think this is more a risk outside of India than within India, because interest rates didn't go particularly low in India, nor do they seem likely to go particularly high either. So I think that's one point. The second is despite what happened yesterday. So yesterday we saw the, the CPI print coming in a little bit higher than expected. US market corrected by 1.5%, right? Whether you look at the NASDAQ or you look at Dow. Mm -hmm. Indian market today is up. Now, for me, that's not good news. Uh, it's uh, simply because we are in an environment where we are ignoring bad news. When a market as large as the US corrects by 4 5% for the Indian market to shirk it entirely and to move up, shows me that market sentiment is quite positive, right? And there is obviously a lot of retail participation and so on. So that makes me a little bit nervous. So, you know, we spoke about valuations being 10% above average. You know, when you're above average valuations, obviously sentiment is more positive. And the fact that sentiment is more positive means you will start ignoring bad news. And that's what happened yesterday in particular. So I think uh, I think that's something which is worth keeping in mind. I think this is a market which has bounced back quite nicely. Uh, we peaked in in October of last year, we bottomed in June, and then we snapped back very sharply and we're up 30 odd percent from the lows of June. The mid cap index is today close to its all time high, if not at a new all time high. Small cap and mid cap, uh, small cap and large cap indices are 5% off their highs. I think there's an environment to be a little bit careful. Uh, we are, it's not a market which is cheap. It's not a market which is extremely expensive. It's a market which is a bit expensive, right? So the more expensive you get, the more trouble you're in. The cheaper the market is, the better it is. Um, so we're not, you know, bang in the middle. We are a little bit more than average. Uh, as I said, 10% for nifty and 10% for small cap, 15, 18% for mid cap. So I would keep that in mind. I think this is a environment to do staggered investing. This is not an environment to get aggressive. This is not an environment I don't think to do large lump sum investing. This is not an environment to put in, to change asset allocation in favor of equities in a significant fashion. I think it's time to be careful. Um, one can keep investing because we're still not terribly expensive, but I would keep lump sum for a brighter day. And actually, oddly enough, in equity markets, a brighter day is a gloomy day, right? So when markets correct is when you really want to put more money to work. And when markets, you know, rise up, you want to typically be more careful. So I would think that this is the key uh, as far as uh, investing goes. But the long, you know, the, the other point in this Ishta is the longer you invest, the less all of this matters. Valuations are particularly relevant if you're a three to five year investor. But if you're a 10 to 15 year investor, then valuations become less relevant, growth becomes more important. Understood. I like how a brighter market day is an oxymoron when it comes to the Indian markets, or well, markets in general. Um, you're right. Uh, Indian market today was up despite, uh, despite the US markets. And there are a lot of commentary already on one day's performance, whether we have decoupled uh, or we cut the umbilical cord with the mothership and whatnot. Um, makes sense. So uh, I think we should, that's, that's actually great perspective. Moving on, I think, um, you know, uh, Chirag, you're very well known for your stock picking skills. I know that we cannot discuss any specific stocks before your uh, compliance comes screaming at me. Uh, so we would love to hear how do you go about screening for, for your stocks and what is the methodology that you use when it comes to stock picking? So, you know, I'm a rather old fashioned investor. So my first boss, uh, he said, you should invest uh, SST. So I said, you know, what is SST? So he said, he said, Sasta, Sundar and Tikau, right? And uh, it sounds very flimsy and it sounds uh, a bit casual, right? So let me explain that a little bit because it's really a philosophy which works well, but one can't just take it at face value. When you think of Sasta, it means companies which are reasonably priced. It doesn't mean that you have to buy everything cheap. 
but you have to have an eye on valuations and you want to buy businesses which are sensibly priced. They don't have to be dirt cheap. They can be a little bit expensive, but they shouldn't typically be horrendously expensive because eventually that will land you in trouble. So very often you want to, depending on which sector you are, you want to buy into businesses which are trading at 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 20 P's, but you don't want to get carried away beyond that. You can buy things which are more expensive so long as the outlook is good. But typically you want to buy reasonably priced businesses. The Sundar respect uh, refers to businesses of good quality, right? You want to buy businesses with decent ROEs, decent return on capital employed and decent free cash flows, right? And the Tikau is businesses which are sustainable and businesses which are understandable. So you want to buy understandable businesses which are going to be here for the longer term, businesses which are reasonably priced and businesses which have decent ROEs and ROCs. Now, the, the, the trick is in a cheap market, they're easy to get because the valuations are much more affordable, right? Because the quality of the business typically doesn't change dramatically. The valuations can change dramatically. So in a cheap market, you're littered with ideas. There are plenty to choose from. In an expensive market, there are few and far between ideas. In a market which is sort of trending in the middle, you tend to have some buy ideas and some sell ideas. And I think that's a little bit where we are today. It's getting harder and harder as the market goes up. But I think the, I, the focus is you should try and buy these decent quality businesses at reasonable prices, hold on for the long term, uh, buy into dips into the market, buy into dips into companies. But I think a reasonable return on equity and capital employed in the mid-teens, valuations which are sensible. Uh, and I think understandability of business is extremely important. Got it. I think um, that is probably the key to good stock picking from you. Um, we'll take one question from the, the Q&A box. Uh, which sectors do you think can have negative earnings surprise due to this geopolitical situation and one should avoid to protect returns and capital? Well, um, I think the sector which is obviously most sensitive to what happens globally is commodities, right? And uh, even now, commodity prices, while they may have corrected 30, 40%, this is after they have risen 100, 200% in some cases. And I think if global growth slows down, then external facing businesses will struggle relatively more. Uh, so that includes commodity businesses because commodity prices are determined by what happens at a global level. So commodity prices come down and all of a sudden, uh, you know, metal stocks will uh, can see a sharp, uh, uh, downward revision in earnings. I think that's one. And I think generally export oriented businesses can see uh, some degree of slowdown. Uh, that could be IT, that could be a little bit of pharma, but you have to be very, very specific because in general, IT is a bit more of a secular trend, right? Because I think the movement towards digitization, the movement towards productivity, uh, all of that is likely to continue. Um, and I think that is somewhat true in pharma as well. Uh, so it is very company specific and geography specific. I think the trend towards um, uh, more generics over a period of time will continue, but of course it depends on pricing and so on. But just to simplify all of this, I think the sector which is probably the most vulnerable uh, would be commodities. Understood. And since you spoke on IT and pharma, just quickly, there's a, another question on in Q&A box. What are your views for the correlation of Indian IT and pharma sector? Visa vis a vis US, which is showing recessionary pressure. So essentially the question that we just spoke about. So I'm going to let you, Ashta, answer the pharma question since you're the pharma expert. I will uh, talk about IT a bit. Uh, so my general view on IT is uh, demand at this point seems uh, somewhat resilient, right? And that's the feedback that we're getting um, the last quarter and the last couple of quarters. Uh, but that can change, right? Because we're just seeing the beginning of a slowdown in the US. And if that changes, then that commentary and uh, growth can slow down. Uh, we are seeing some pressure or reasonable pressure on profitability because there is a shortage of labor and we are seeing wage inflation take place. So margins under pressure, right now, growth is good, margins under pressure. If growth slows down, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, this sector will have to be looked at more carefully because valuations can come off. Valuations today are still 15, 20 25% above their historical averages. So I think we have to keep an eye out for growth because uh, 60 to 70% of revenues of Indian IT companies do come from the US. So I'd be a little bit careful on IT. I would uh, 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 pick and choose individual businesses and I would wait for prices to become a little bit more benign. But having said that, uh, IT has already corrected 20, 30% from the top. 
So things are already starting to look more interesting. So we take a stock specific approach. The more things fall, the more interesting they become. And we are getting to an environment where things are becoming uh, uh, quite a bit more interesting, but we will pick and choose individual businesses. As far as pharma goes, I think, uh, you know, it's very, very stock specific. Different pharma companies have very, very, very different profiles. But we can certainly say uniformly, at least, that domestic pharma seems to be doing quite well. Right. So there is this good nine to 12 percent growth, which we are seeing across the board in domestic pharma. There are those businesses, there's some which are stronger, some which are weaker. But generally, domestic pharma seems to be in a good place. But the problem is domestic pharma in some cases is 65 percent of profitability. In other cases, it's 100 uh, percent and in some cases, 25 percent. So you have to look at each company on their individual merit because the balance number is sometimes US based, which is uh, still uh, where you still see pricing pressure. In some cases, it's the rest of the world, which is doing reasonably well. It's also very product specific, therapy specific, and so on. Um, so I think, uh, but the general comment I would make is pharma company valuations are in line or at a slight discount to historical averages, uh, which is not bad news. And domestic pharma is doing reasonably well. US is still a bit of a challenge. Uh, rest of the world is okay. So you have to look at individual profiles, individual managements, R&D capabilities, new product launches, therapy focuses. So it's a bit more complex, right? It's a long answer to a short question. Uh, and if you have anything to add to that, Ishida, you can. Um, so first I must correct for the house that pharma expert is probably the wrong terminology. Pharma student is probably the right. But no, I agree with you. So US recessionary pressures, I think have very little to do with the US pharma industry since it's inelastic demand. US and pharma, well, pharma in US has its own problems with uh, the Senate and the House uh, trying to pass a legislation to, um, you know, curb prices by not letting pharmacy benefit managers and the others, uh, or well, allowing them to start negotiations. So that's a different thing. But then 2023 is going to be uh, a historic year in terms of US pharma, where um, a lot of biosimilars, a lot of biologics are going to go off patent and a lot of biosimilars are going to enter. So I think overall, and whenever this kind of shift happens, so when Hatch Waxman happened uh, some time ago, it is always great for Indian companies because we are generic uh, manufacturers. Having said that, completely echo what you say, that um, not a, there are no two uh, pharma companies in the Indian pharma world which are the same and can be compared. So I think uh, overall, one, one must understand who is the end consumer and how much can that consumer pay and what are your margins based off of that. Uh, definitely domestic pharma has been the flavor of the season um, with everybody uh, harping on them and uh, they are doing well actually, but depends, what are you selling? Is it branded generics? Is it hospital generics? Is it complex hospital generics? So I think th that is my overall, well, our overall view in pharma as well. Uh, so yeah, the short answer in pharma is to be extremely stock specific and pick up the right trend. Um, moving further to you. Um, so, um, uh, Chirag, any contra bet, any contrarian sector view? Um, so, I, you know, I think uh, banking is a little bit contrarian in the sense that it has underperformed uh, of late. Um, and that is despite fundamentals improving. So we spoke about uh, asset quality improving and capital adequacy rising and growth improving. But despite all of this, we've seen farm, uh, banking in general has underperformed. And I think part of that is because of the FII selling which has taken place and FIIs are large holders in the financial space. So I think that has contributed to an underperformance of that sector. I think it's a bit contrarian, uh, but I don't see any large ignored sectors out there. Um, you know, we are, we are generally positive on defense. We're generally positive on uh, on banking, uh, somewhat positive on capital goods, uh, constructive on pharma at a stock specific level. Um, and I said apprehensive on consumer staples and increasingly interested in IT, but so far been a bit underweight. Um, but I don't see any large sectors which are clear sort of contrarians, which are highly neglected. Nobody wants to own them, which are very cheap and so on. I don't see anything contrarian out that way. Got it. I know we are, our cutoff time is 4.45. So I will just take one question live. Um, Kishorji, I'll take it from you. If you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, Chirag, uh, am I audible? Yes, yes you are. Uh, 
Srirag, thanks for an excellent presentation. Uh, my question is that since the earnings are not that normalized after COVID and because of geopolitical risk, uh, how do you evaluate based on price to book multiple? What are the long-term averages for the market as a whole for large cap, mid cap and small cap? And when do you invest in sectors where you are comfortable with price to book multiple? So when you look at price to book, uh, it gives you a similar story to price to earnings in the sense that uh, today price to book is also at, uh, depending on which sector and company and so on, is still at a premium. So we spoke about P's, uh, Mr. Shah, at being at about a 10% premium. Uh, price to book is also at a 10, 50% premium to historical averages. So it suggests a similar story that we are a little bit expensive. Uh, sectors where price to book is still below historical averages. And if you go back to the sector slide, uh, which we showed earlier, banks, we showed price to book because you'd look at banks as price to book as opposed to uh, price to earnings. And that's a one sector which even now, both public banks as well as private sector banks, barring a few names, valuations are still below long-term price to book, right? You can see that in some of the well-known large caps and you can see that in a number of mid caps and PSUs as well. Um, so I would say that the broad picture painted by on valuations is similar for price to earnings and similar for price to book that we are a little bit expensive. There's no doubt about that. And uh, the similar story for banks in that both on a P as well as on a PB basis that uh, uh, banks are uh, reasonably priced. Thanks. Uh, another question. What is your view on capital goods sector when you evaluate it from price to book as well? Um, so uh, there are, you know, capital goods has all types of businesses in it, right? Because you include defense companies, domestic manufacturing entities, mm -hmm. uh, MNC companies, and so on. Uh, there are a number of companies out there which are phenomenally expensive. And I would not suggest uh, getting close to them, especially the MNCs are very, very, very expensive. And mm -hmm. they will trade at six times, seven times price to book. And um, it just doesn't make sense to us. Um, there are a number of uh, non-MNC Indian businesses where price to book at uh, sort of uh, two, two and a half times uh, is still sensible uh, uh, compared to how they've traded historically. So I think those domestic names are yeah. still okay. Then you have a number of construction companies where price to book is even more attractive, uh, but those ROEs are not high. And therefore, I would not think that uh, they deserve a high price to book, but even on their low price to book compared to average, uh, they're still okay. Um, so I would summarize it this way. I think in general, within capital goods, the outlook for CapEx spending is very positive. Government is spending, corporate CapEx is looking a little bit better and private CapEx, which is on, house, which is on houses and residentials is also looking up. So cap, in general, CapEx is a decent story, but it's a mixed bag in terms of valuations with MNCs being very expensive, uh, domestic companies being mixed, uh, uh, construction companies being cheap, but you have to be careful because there are always some degree of cheapness there. And uh, I think things like defense having a good long-term uh, outlook. So we have, it seems that we have hit our time limit. So before we close out the session, Chirag, if you can just give your last words and any advice or for retail investors. Sure, I would say that, you know, you know uh, I think the key is uh, in all of this is to focus on the long-term. The focus should be on investing regularly. Uh, the problem with most investors in is, is they invest in a lump sum fashion and therefore your starting point becomes extremely important. If you invest in a staggered fashion, you stagger out your investment points and therefore the there is no one starting point which will make a big difference because you're investing continuously. Look at asset allocation, invest for the long term, be aggressive when the market is down, be conservative when the market is up. When a lot of people are saying this is the time to invest, be careful. When everybody says this is a terrible time to invest, market is a casino, be more optimistic. When the news is bad, invest more. When the news is good, invest less. Use your common sense. I think all of us have great common sense. We just forget to rely on it. So use your common sense to judge. When the newspapers are splashed with bad news, when the CNBC anchors look very despondent, that's a good time to increase allocation. Right. So I would keep that in mind. And I think today we're in a market which is somewhere in the middle, but a little bit expensive. Um, so it's not, uh, one has to be a little bit careful, but if you have a long enough horizon, I think you'll do okay.
Wow, that's the ultimate, uh, I think, contra contra way to see things. Fantastic. So thank you so much, Chirag. This was excellent. Uh, you were a treasure trove of information and wisdom. Hope we can even emulate 10% of what you taught us uh, this afternoon. It obviously feels too less, but then I'm hoping that we can uh, do a round two of this conversation very soon. I hope so. Thank, thank you, you so Thank you, everybody.